God offer our service and a word of prayer and thank Him for all the blessings of this past week and what He's going to do for us in the coming week. Shall we pray? Father God, we bless You this day for all that You mean to us, for everything that You have done for us. In spite of our disobedience and our unwillingness to follow You sometimes, You still seek to draw us back to You always and to put us back on that right track. I can always remember my grandfather saying that in spite of God, he accomplished great things in his faith during the week. And because in spite of the way that he would treat God, and Lord, that's a blessing because it shows to us your long sufferingness. It shows to us, Lord, that you care for us even when we stumble. You forgive us of our many sins, and we just thank you for that. And we thank you for being an understanding God. We come here this morning weary from our labors of the past week. We come seeking a refreshing of our spirit. And we ask you to please fill our hearts and our minds and our souls today to the overflowing with good things. And help us to listen to your voice this day. Just a little bit later, Father, we're going to talk in our sermon about finding joy in the journey. Because with everyone here this morning, we all know that we have issues going on in our life with our health, with our home life, with children, spouses, with bills, things happening at work that just aren't so pleasant, Father, if we're honest with ourselves. But Lord, today from the book of 1 Peter, we're going to study in how we can find joy in spite of all of that. Amen. So Lord, clear our hearts and minds and help us to listen to the music today and then the message to follow. Help us to make this church a beacon on this hill to reach out to all who come seeking shelter from the world. And may we live out our faith in ways that are relevant and that are true and ways that are going to help others with the love of Jesus. We ask all of this in the wonderful name of Christ Jesus our Lord and the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated, and again, it's so good to see each of us here this morning. She would come and read to us from the book of Psalms, chapter 25, in the first seven verses. Okay, you all, after I calm down from having so much joy this morning. Amen. I'm going to read um, from Psalms 25, verses 1 through 7. In you, Lord my God, I put my trust. I trust in you. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one who hopes in your will will ever be put to shame, but shame will not come to those who are treacherous without cause. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are my God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from, for they are from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me. For you, Lord, are good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Amen. At this time, let's turn in our hymnals to number 607, and we'll sing our hymn of prayer as we think about all of those whose names were just mentioned those names that are still in our bulletin from weeks past and months past even, and remember that God is continuing to work with those situations. So let's sing our hymn of prayer, which is number 607, In All the Seasons, Seeking God. Oh. 
God of most gracious heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, thankful to be in your house again this morning, dear Lord. We thank you for this beautiful week, beautiful weather that we've had. Lord, we pray for those that, that are harmed by the hurricanes and the, the winds and stuff up the East Coast. We pray that the, that bass are going out to sea and to get all of what they're getting ready to do, Lord. Yes. Lord, we pray for those this morning who are sick, those spoken and unspoken requests, those people that are in the hospitals, the nursing homes. Lord, we ask the spoken and unspoken request we spoke of, Lord, we ask you to reach out to the big hand and bring them back to us. Be with us next week. Lord, again, we pray for our firefighters, our police officers, our doctors and nurses, especially our military people, those that are away from home so long. We ask you to guide us and direct us through this day and through the rest of this week. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
all of the actual blessings upon his bread. The symbol that Christ gave us himself, the representative of God, that would be broken, tortured, finally killed upon that cross of for our salvation. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
Thing, he didn't have a great outlook on life, did he? Things don't always go as they're planned. And the truth is, nobody, even what you might think is the luckiest person in the world, nobody sails through this life without storms. Trouble is something that we're all going to have to deal with. There's a military chaplain I read in the book one time said he had a, door, a sign on his door and it said, if you have troubles, please come and tell me about them. And if you don't, please come in and tell me how you do it. <laughs> That's a pretty good point. Now, in 1 Peter that we just read, in verse 6, I'm going to read that verse again. In all this you greatly rejoice, for now through a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. I want you to notice the phrase, you may have to endure and suffer grief and all kinds of trials. And what kind of hardship is Peter talking about there, preacher? Well, Peter's writing there to believers. To kind of put this into context, Peter is writing to believers who are going through very hard times. And those hard times were caused largely in part because they were Christians. Peter is writing from Rome. And probably just a by dating this, probably just a few months before, by some accounts, the emperor of Rome, Nero, burned Rome to the ground, and then you know who he blamed? The Christians. Well, Peter's writing from Rome there, and all this is going on. Well, Paul was martyred during the aftermath of Rome's burning. So when shortly after that, Paul was killed and became a martyr for the faith. Followers of Jesus were already beginning to be singled for persecution. Now, not every Christian back then was thrown to the lions. We've heard about that. But a lot were. And that was going on at that time. And there was just something ominous in the air during that time about terrible things to come. And such were the times in which Peter was writing. But it doesn't really matter what kinds of trials make life tough. No matter where our tough times come from, Peter's message offers insights to all of us, even those of us here today, thousands of years later, who are facing hardships. As a pastor, I have many people turn to me with life problems. Many of them are not members of our church even, but as a servant of God, I minister to all who come to me, and I don't turn anybody away. And a lot of times I'll get asked, what do you do when you're faced with bad news from your doctor? How do you respond when your spouse walks out on them after they've betrayed you for so long, how do you handle the excruciating pain of losing a child? The most difficult funeral that I have ever had to do in my entire life was the loss of a grandson and a grandmother in one car accident and to deal with the rest of the family and to try to think of something that was of at least a little bit of comfort to them. People ask me, how do you deal with a bad habit? How do you kick an addiction that's messing up your life, but you just can't seem to break its grip on your life? And on and on I can go. And so when Peter begins his letter, he doesn't express how sorry he is that life can be so hard for them. But instead, how does he start his letter? He gives praise to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's exactly how he starts that letter. Amen. And he adds to that, so truly be glad because there is wonderful joy ahead even though you have to endure many trials for a little while. Amen? Amen. So don't say I didn't warn you. We're going to go through it. From this day forward, we none of us know what's going to happen in the next hour. But Paul, Peter gave us this wonderful promise from the Scriptures that there's joy ahead. Now notice how Peter talks about being truly glad and wonderful joy in the midst of hardship. And so the question I want to answer today is, what reasons does Peter give to back this up? Why does he back, how can we back up what he says that we're, we should be glad and that we're going to have joy with? Why can Christ followers still find reason for joy when the times are tough? So I want you to notice these five things before we leave today. Hopefully I can get through them all. If you want to jot them down, you can. If not, I can give them to you later. These five things are our insights for having joy in tough times moving forward. The first insight to capture joy in tough times is to remind us that mind ourselves that God tells us Many, many times in the Scriptures, we are only passing through. Amen? 
This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up where? Some far beyond the blue. Somewhere far beyond the blue. Peter writes, he's writing this letter to encourage people. I love people who do that. I love encouraging those. We get enough bad mail, don't we? The bad, it don't matter what's email and you're doing now, whether it's snail mail as they call it, it comes in your box. We don't like bad mail, we don't like bills, we don't like letters that say IRS or anything like that. But we like encouraging letters. I love to get little postcards. I have a dear saint who, uh, she used to go to church with me probably 25 years ago, and I was her music director. And I still, almost every holiday, if not on a holiday, once a month or every two months, she'll send me a little note card. And it will just say something in there. And Halloween, she'll just write nothing. Something so simple as, hope you get lots of candy. Love, Joe. Or she'll say, hope you're still singing. Miss your beautiful voice. Love, Joe. Just two lines. But boy, it makes your whole day, man. Something like that. Right. So think about that. Buy you next time you're at the dollar store, buy you a pack of cars and think of some people and send out some notes and look at the lives you'll change and look at the smiles. You won't see them, but they'll, they'll be put there. The smiles are put on people's face just by encouraging. Well, that's what Peter's doing. He's writing this letter to encourage the people, not to discourage them by telling them, yeah, you're going to have tough times. He gives them that encouraging upswing at the end to say, but you're going to have joy tomorrow. As we read his letter today, you and me, his encouragement is based on this. Folks, we're only passing through. What we're going through right now, this world is not our home. These things are not permanent. They will come to pass. Folks, when the heat is on, we need to have a long view of life, not a short view. Because this life, as we know, it's not going to last forever. Right. We in this world are going to pass. And there's going to come a time when you and I, as followers of Jesus, are going to be going home. And we're not home yet, but we're going home. Aren't you glad about that? Amen. We're on the journey to go home. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 16 says what kind of home it is. It said they're looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. God has prepared a heavenly city for them. And there it's talking about the heroes of our faith. And one day, you and I are going to be fully alive and awake in a heavenly home. The minute that our life leaves this old, worn-out body, it's going to, we're going to wake up in the presence of God Almighty. And that is such a blessing. I know there was a preacher talking one time during a funeral message. And he was trying to get everybody to understand that this body is just temporary, but the soul is permanent. So to get his point across, for better or for worse, he stepped out and he pointed at the casket and he said, Brother John here is not here any longer. He said, think about this way. This is the shell. This is like the shell of the nut and the nut has gone to heaven. <laughs> you see, it is great to be a Christian on this side of eternity. It is great to be a Christian now because you know that you have been forgiven. Amen. You don't have to live with regrets. And you know that your life is significant because God has given your life meaning and purpose. And it's great to be a Christian because God is with you and He has adopted you and He loves you. Jesus wasn't merely a good teacher that provided us with some inspiration on how to live life and wrote a few inspirational books and, and how-to books. He came to give us everlasting life forever. He came to bring us home, and when life gets tough, that's what we need to remember. That this is temporary, no matter what you're going through, all these things that weigh you down, it'll all be gone one day. And it'll just be you and the Lord in heaven with all of those who have accepted Him. No matter how things get bad, no matter how tough they are in this world today, we're only passing through. The second thing to get that joy in tough times is to remember that God reassures you of a living hope. God reassures you of a living hope. Would you agree with me that today, at this point in time in history, we all need massive doses of hope? Amen? Amen. Back in the 1950s, those of you who've lived around here and can remember, plans were finalized to build Smith Mountain Dam. Landowners were contacted and they were told that their property would be bought for them whether they wanted to sell it or not. And the residents were given notice so that they could find somewhere else to make their home. What do you think happened to those farms and those homes and those yards? Well, I'll tell you. They became neglected. Fences were not repaired. 
They were not repainted. Renovations that maybe had been on the books or planned were canceled. If you had a leaky roof, you put a little patch on it rather than replace it. You see, the homeowners no longer had any hope in their property because they knew what was going to happen pretty soon. It was going to be underwater. It wouldn't be theirs much longer. No family reunion on the farm next year. No passing it down to your heirs or anything of the like. That's the cost of a lack of hope. Things fall into disrepair. And Peter says in verse 3, God has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. God wants your life to be immersed in hope. The Christian's hope is a living hope, not a dead hope or a false hope. What is the opposite of a living hope? That's the false hope. Is there a false hope that some people cling to? Well, sure. People cling to false hope everywhere. Every time somebody buys a lottery ticket, there's a false hope that they're going to win. And even when they do win, they cling to the false hope that it's going to be the answer to their unhappiness. And if you think that's the case, just Google lottery winners and see how many of them went from here to here. But every time I say to you, hope to see you next Sunday, or when the New Year's rolls around, we make those resolutions, as we call them. We say, this is what I hope to do this year. We're not really sure whether our plans are going to succeed or not, do we? Because we don't control everything. And even the best laid plans of all of us are just tentative. But you have a living hope because you're a believer. And that's not based on any wishful thinking. That's based on the promises of Christ our Savior in the good book. The hope of which Peter speaks is an anchored event in our history that we can point to. And your hope and my hope is based on Jesus' resurrection. Amen? And that's why Peter calls it a living hope. And since nobody can go back and undo history, nobody can steal our living hope. The third thing that you're able to do to capture joy in those tough times is to remember that God has redeemed me. Remember that God has redeemed me. There, a research firm did this study. And they said that this generation upcoming will inherit more from those behind them than any generation before. The world's wealth has grown and grown and grown exponentially. But you know, it's only cash. It's only stuff. It's going to be taxed. It's going to be spent. Much of it on lawyers and accountants. Some of it will be fought over. Some of it will divide families. I've seen that happen before. A lot of it will be squandered. And even if the inheritance was invested in the world's most secure investments, those investments in the end will not last. There's no guarantee that today's fortune is still going to be there tomorrow. And we know well from the economic times that we've had and ups and downs over the past eight, nine years that these things are true. The things that are bought are going to rust through. They're going to wear out. They're going to burn up. They're going to waste away. They're going to be stolen. They're going to be neglected. They're going to go out of fashion. They're going to be cast aside. That's the nature of our perishable and temporary world. But if you notice in verse 4 of where we read in 1 Peter 1, God has given us an inheritance that can never perish, fall, or fade, kept in heaven for you. Your inheritance in Christ is glory. And it's a glory that can never perish fade or perish. Amen. What does that mean? Well, it means your inheritance in the city whose maker and ruler is God is incorruptible. And Peter uses those descriptions of incorruptibility to make his point. So what's in store for us is absolutely 100% secure. Amen? Amen? Your heavenly inheritance ain't going to be damaged. It's not going to be stolen or taken away. It's never going to wear out. God's promise to us as His children is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In the words of Matthew 6, verse 9, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and uh, vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Amen. Do you remember from the Bible how in Exodus a remarkable thing happened? What happened to the shoes and the clothes of the Israelites in those 40 years they were in the wilderness? Never wore out. You ever had a pair of shoes like that? I have to borrow a pair of tennis shoes every six months. And trust me, I do not run anywhere. I might run if you play a pork chop across the room, but that would be about as far as I can. Pretty much I'll walk here anywhere. 
But we have to replace our clothes, don't we? We have to replace our shoes. Not the Israelites. God knew that during their journey through the desert, they couldn't stop at Macy's and buy some new clothes. They couldn't stop at Pickway and get a new pair of shoes. So he made it so that the clothes they wore and the sandals on their feet never wore out. Amen. Amen. He preserved their clothes for the journey. And he so cared for them that he did that. As God preserved those clothes and sandals of His people, so will your eternal inheritance never wear out, never fade, never rust, never grow old. Yeah. Quickly, two more points. The fourth insight to capture joy in those tough times is that God will refine you for genu genuine faith. God refines each of us for genuine faith. The first part of verse 7 says these trials are only to test your faith to show that it's strong and pure. And it's being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. And your faith is much more precious to God than gold. Peter says when trials come, it's a, it's a time for us to reflect on how we can trust God more in it and through it. So God refines us. And you know when you refine gold, you know what's required? Fire. Heat. They heat the gold up till it melts. You see those bars of gold in the books at Fort Knox? Well, they heat that up. The gold that comes out of the earth, all of the dirt, all of the rocks, all of the gravel, everything they call dross, D-R-O-S-S, -S, that rises up to the top of that liquid gold and they skim it off. And then when they pour it in the molds and it cools down to a hardened bar again, it's 99.99% pure gold. So in order to get that chaff or that dross out of our lives, sometimes we have to go through the fire. Amen? That's right. Every once in a while we have to go through that fire. God values you far more than gold or your bank account or anything, so He puts that trouble sometimes to cross our path to build that authentic faith. It helps others along life's way when you react to it in a positive, Christ-like way. People see that in you. It's a general piece of human wisdom to realize that hardship either embitters you or helps you become a better person. So remember that. Tough times will make you bitter or they'll make you better. It's only... One letter difference. In most instances in life, what's more important in life is not what trials you face, but how you face them. Right. You go through a lot, but if you respond to it in a positive way, people see that in you. Say, Man, I don't what that person has. Do you see how they handle that illness? How they handle that financial hardship? What do they have that I don't have? And that opens up the door for Christ's testimony in your life every time. You see, we don't always follow God's will, but even when God's will is not done here on earth, we can respond according to God's will. Somebody said one time, they said, life is 90% how you react to what happens to you and only 10% of what happens to you. And that's true. That's why Jesus teaches us to pray and we pray every Sunday morning, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven because God's will is often not done here on earth. God says, even though this isn't my original plan for this world, I want to use this hardship now to draw you closer to me. And you can still respond in a way that honors me. And then the last thing I want to share with you before we go this morning, the last thing in how to capture joy in tough times is that God replenishes me and refills me with inexpressible joy, as the Scripture puts it. Verse 8, it says, you are filled with a glorious, inexpressible joy. I want you to circle, if, you write, if you're one of those people who writes in your Bible, circle even now. Because that means today. That means here and now. A lot of people look at the Bible and say, oh, it's just a bunch of stories wrote thousands of years ago. It doesn't apply to anything now. We've got new stuff now. We've got new technology. We've got trains and planes and TV. And we've got stuff that causes problems that God never knew about. Hmm. Lift the hand down so far that they're going to trip over it when they start right. walking. Right. But that says in the Bible, even now. Even now means today. God knew we were going to be reading this today. God knows about this very moment in life right now. Amen? Man. He knows you're sitting here. He knows you're listening to His Word being proclaimed. So that means this day, this day, this moment in your life, that even now you can be happy with an inexpressible and glorious joy. God wants to remind you that joy isn't something reserved just for heaven. We're going to be joyful when we get there, but God has some joy for His people down here. Joy is something that is reserved for today, even now, for all who believe in Him. 
So now remember, Peter was writing, talked about in the outset, people who were being pers persecuted, Christians who were being persecuted, people whose jobs were on the line because they believed in God, some of whom were to be arrested, some of them who were to be martyred, like Paul and later on Peter himself. And Peter tells them, and despite all that, even now, even now you can be joyful. Amen. Now folks, understand that Peter wasn't writing the spiritual giants here. These were mature and immature believers and among those to whom he was wrong. And God doesn't expect you to have reached the stratosphere of spiritual maturity today. Lord knows I haven't. I'm still working on it. He's still working on me. Amen. And God doesn't expect all of us to have reached that level yet. And he wants us to know that we can still be joyful in those hard times. All you need is Christ Amen. to be joyful. All you need to know is that Christ is all in all in your situation. And you can be happy with a glorious, inexpressible joy. And notice that final verse, verse 6, uh, the last verse I'm going to share with you. In all this you greatly rejoice, for now in a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. You see, God's always going to be with you, and He's always bigger than any problem we have. Amen. 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 That's all He has. Remember, God always honors faith. And so, folks, this coming week, it's going to bring you good times. But you know what? It might even bring you some challenges. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to choose joy. And I want you to, even now, be joyful anyway. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your presence with us today. You have blessed this time that we have had. And we thank you for allowing us to come here today and praise you and adore you. Lord, we wish more people were present in your house today. But Lord, we can remedy that by going out this week and sharing our faith with someone, inviting someone to church, Lord. Let them know what a blessing it is to hear from your word and to talk and to sing and to pray with others of like faith. Lord, don't let the learning and the conversations of this gathering today die. But instead, may they continue to stir within us and bear fruit in our ministries throughout the coming week until we find ourselves together here again. And once again, we remember those people and those situations that are on our hearts and minds and all those that were shared earlier. Deal graciously with each one in your own way and your own time. And be with that one who needs to make a decision for thee at this time. Give them the courage and the willpower to step out and come forward and share their heart with us, their friends. And then as we depart from this space in just a few minutes, we ask you to bless us through the remainder of the day, to guide us safely home, and to use us as your servants in the days ahead. And we ask this in the name of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us turn in our hymnals now. If you have anything at all to share with us, please come forward. We're going to turn our hymnals to number 601 and we're going to sing, I am thine, O Lord. If you have anything at all to share with us, please come and someone will meet here with you at the front of the church.
I go, and I know you do too, but all they need is an encouraging word and to know that they can have the joy here in this life too. And we can share Christ with them and let them know that that's the way that they can do that. Hope you have an awesome week this week. If you need me for any reason, please uh, give me a call. Uh, otherwise, right now, as we prepare to go out into the mission field, let's respond with our commissioning statement. I'll give our benediction and we'll send our full response for the month of September. We're going to say, God be with you till we meet again. In the power of the risen Lord, we go out into the world to fulfill our calling as the people of God, the body of Christ. May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace, this both now and forevermore. Amen.